Hi, my name's Hank O'Neill and I've been taking pictures for many, many years and I think the first one was in about 1953 when I was 13 years old and I continue to do it uh, and into the 1970s I began taking many, many more pictures, um, mostly when it was related to work projects that I was involved with and I've selected uh, a handful of photographs that are from various parts of my career in photography beginning in about 1977 all the way up until last year um, and they give a, a, a relatively interesting overview of the kind of things that I've done for all these years and I thought I would talk a minute or two about these pictures in chronological order about what they were made for, how they were used and how they've been used in even recent recent months and years. Um, the first one that I have, in 1977 I was making a lot of records, LPs, and it was not a, um, uh, for RCA or Columbia or a company like that, it was my own company. I didn't have all the money in the world, so I was also the photographer for the record covers. and. In 1977, I think about October or November, I made a record with a wonderful vocalist named Joan LaBarbera, and she had a piece that she had written called Tape Songs. And I thought that was an interesting title, and I decided to try to work that into a cover, and we did. Um, I took maybe 50 rolls of half-inch recording tape, and created a dress out of it for Joan. And this became the photograph for the front of the record tape songs. It had a life of its own. It was uh, displayed in record store windows. I mean, if people could have just bought the photograph, they would have, um, they, 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 instead of the record. It was a very, very popular cover. A few years ago, I was walking down the street and looked in a bookstore window, and they had a, a new book that had come out that's called um, Vinyl Records and Covers by Artist. And there was my Joan LaBarbera record mixed in with Andy Warhol and Duchamp and all sorts of fancy pictures. And then about two years ago, I was contacted by some people in Spain who wanted to use the, uh, the picture on banners and posters in uh, Madrid for a poetry festival. So I got out all the negatives and so forth and scanned them and uh, made new prints. And the photograph wound up looking like this. This is what I sent to the people in Spain. This is one that I saved uh, that Joan signed for me. She's still very much alive and that's very good. About the same time, in actually the same studio, um, I took photographs of two very noted women. At that time, I was working on a, a book project uh, with Bernice Abbott about um, her work, her life and work in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. And the editor of that book was Jacqueline Onassis. And um, one day Mrs. Onassis came down to look at photographs at the studio. It was a Sunday afternoon and we worked all afternoon. And she had found, she saw a, a table of books that I had about a French photographer named Atje. And she said, oh Hank, can I borrow this? And I said, Sure, by all means, whatever you want to do. She had just done a book about Atje for Doubleday, the company for which she worked. And I said, by all means, take it. I said, but there's, there's one, one thing I'd like to do. And she said, what's that? And I, I said, well, let me take a picture of you holding it. And she says, that's fine. That's a good idea. And so we went downstairs to my photo studio downstairs. 
where I always had a 4x5 camera set up underneath the skylight. And Jackie stood still for three pictures. These were long exposures. These were full second exposures. Um, we took this, this picture of Ms. Onassis, and it was possibly the only posed picture with a large format camera she ever did after um, President Kennedy was assassinated. I mean, I, I don't know of any. Um, and it sort of had a life of its own. When Heritage Auctions started selling um, photographs, this, this picture was on the front of the catalog for the very first auction that they, they produced. And then about two weeks later, Bernice Abbott came to the studio. She came down from Maine and um, to, to look at pictures and organize some things as well. And <clears throat> Bernice hated to have her photograph taken. She did not like to take a picture. Anyway, we had worked all afternoon and um, Bernice all of a sudden said, I've got to go back to Maine. That afternoon. Now, this is four, five o'clock in the afternoon, and she was 450 miles from home, and she was 80 years old. That was going to drive back to Maine that night. And um, she put on her car coat, and I said, well, Bernice, before you go, let me take a picture of you getting ready to go to Maine in your car coat and everything like that. I said, no, oh, I don't want to take a picture. And I said, come on, come downstairs and I'll take the picture exactly in the same place that I took Jackie Onassis. Everybody's trying to take her picture and she doesn't like it, but she really enjoyed it. So come on downstairs. She said, well, okay, if you really hurry. So uh, we went downstairs. The camera was still set up. I made two or three exposures of 4 by 5 film and this one turned out to be my favorite one. So we have... Bernice and Jackie in the same spot, um, two weeks apart, and um, they both turned out okay. And I, I, I thought that was a uh, Bernice was much harder to photograph than than Mrs. Onassis because Bernice was insecure about what she looked like. But this is what she looked like: wearing her car coat, ready to go, and drive nine hours. Starting, I mean, she would probably got home at three in the morning, and she's eighty years old. A few, a few um, years later, uh, a woman that I worked with regularly in those years was Laura Foreman. She ran a dance company uh, that was called Choreographer's Theater. She was quite an interesting choreographer and artist. And she had a show coming up that was very famous uh, and very anticipated at the time called The Monumental Show in Gowanus. It was um, all the most interesting avant-garde people of, of, of the time. And Laura had um, made a, a date with me to photograph her on a Saturday at the installation. She had made this marvelous installation at, at, at the gun factory at, at Gowanus where, where the show was held. Unfortunately, on the night of the, the opening night, of the exhibition, uh, representatives or members or whatever of the Jewish Defense League broke in to uh, or stormed into the exhibition and messed up one of the photo or one of the installations that was there that involved a big portrait of Hitler. They cut it up with a knife and strewed garbage all around and so forth. And they shut down the exhibition. The exhibition never went forward. But Laura bribed a, a, a um, person at the facility, and we managed to get in the next day to take a, a photograph of her installation because it was for an, an arts magazine that was very popular in those days that was called Simply Arts. And this is the September 1981 issue of Arts, inside of which is a story about the Monumental Show, which had been photographed and written about um, before it was shut down. And there's photographs, I mean, 
Uh, here is the one that I took on that Saturday of Laura and her installation. Here's a Keith Herring that was right around the corner. And, and here is a photograph of the uh, installation that was messed up by the Jewish Defense League. Um, when I was out there taking the installation pictures of Laura's uh, piece, uh, she was setting things up and I was walking around just looking. And I saw this piece that had been slashed with a knife and garbage strewn around. And it really was a mess. So I went back to Laura and I said, Laura, let's, let's do a picture. And she says, what do you have in mind? And I said, I want you to come over to this Hitler picture and I want you to take off all your clothes and stand in front of it like you're in a gallery and um, you can stand amongst all the garbage and you're looking at it and I think it might be an interesting picture. And this is what was the result. And it's, it's, it's one of my favorites. It's, it's been ex exhibited in, in many shows and, and things like that over the years. Um, it's a long time ago, 1981, but it's, it's really one of my favorites and, and kind of unique. So, life danced on and, and moved on through the 80s and, and into the 90s. And I continued taking photographs of anything that interested me. Um, one of which, starting in the 1980s, was um, a documentation of the Lower East Side. Many, many different artists had decided they wanted to have their way with the picture of Lady Gaga. And they did and they drew faces on them, they drew mustaches, they did, anyway. So I dutifully photographed each one that had been messed up. Of course, I took a picture of the entire thing as well, but I photographed each face that had been messed up. I then took my favorite uh, 50 of the pictures and created a mashup that looks like this. Now this is the first time I have, I, I normally printed this on a piece of canvas that was 40 by 60. Uh, this is the first time I've ever made a small 17 by 22 version of it. But it shows how, I don't know how many different artists did, uh, who did the, the mashup on um, Lady Gaga's face. But I've always thought this was, was extremely interesting. And um, this, is, this is the result. It has normally only been available at charity events and, and things like that. This is the first time it will have been auctioned as a print. Now, right down the street from where this was at, at, uh, at Houston Street um, is the residence of a, of a friend uh, who is one of the most noted photographers in America. His name is Robert Frank. I met Robert in 1981 when he did a record cover for me uh, featuring uh, his friend, Allen Ginsberg. One day in 19, or 2017, I was walking down the street in the Lower East Side and I was approaching Bowery, and I see two people sitting on the sidewalk. Not sitting on the sidewalk, sitting in chairs on the sidewalk. And as I get closer, it, it, I, I see it's Robert and his wife, June Leaf, the, the noted painter. And so I go up and we, we, we chat for a while. And when, after 15 minutes or so, I, I said, well, I, I'm going to go off. I've got to go off and do this and that, and I've taken up enough of your time. Uh, let me take a quick picture and, and, and so forth. And yeah, fine. And so this was the result of Robert Frank and June Leaf uh, sitting in front of their house uh, like, you know, a, a, an old elderly couple. But this is two of the finest American artists there are, I mean, although Robert is actually born in Switzerland, but he's lived here since the late 1940s. Uh, and it's, it's an unusual photograph and the first time that it's ever been 
put up for auction or anything like that. And I remember I, I took this with a regular, ordinary Canon T3i uh, camera that looks like, you know, just a 35 millimeter camera. And um, the last thing Robert said to me as I was walking away, he says, why are you carrying that heavy old camera around? I thought to myself, my goodness, times change. And so, wow. and then, how did that Andy Warhol picture come about? In 1985, a man named Jerry Aronson uh, was making a film about Allen Ginsberg. Allen called me and said, Hank, this guy's making a film about me. We're doing Andy Warhol um, next Thursday or whatever it was. He says, please come and I want you to take all the stills and, and so forth. So I did. I uh, went up to the factory and um, all the cameras were set up and Andy eventually came in and uh, sat down and the interview went off and, and, and it was perfectly fine. It was what, what the, the director of the film needed. I took um, probably no more than well, one roll of film, and but was impressed with the fact that, or depressed as the case may be, that Andy was just not a person who was giving that day. The pictures are all rather straight ahead, you know, no emotion, no much of anything, and. But it was exactly what they needed as a picture to go along with the film and so forth. Well, about a year or so after I did that, I was looking at the at the contact sheet and the bland expression on, on Warhol's face, and I was thinking to myself, what would make this picture a little better? And I don't know where ideas come from, but one popped into my head and I said, Well, why don't I make it as a double exposure? So I took the, the, the most bland picture on the page and made an exposure in the enlarger. And then by carefully marking the corners, I turned it over and turned it upside down and made another. And this was the result. Uh, all four of the eyes going across and it gives it an energy that just the straight ahead picture does not have. And I, I think it's uh, an, an interesting way to portray Andy. Um, later, uh, I, I, this has been used in an installation in a big art center in Canada, but in addition to this picture, uh, all the color versions of it that exist, and this would be the very first time that I've, I normally release this as a 24 by 24 inch print on canvas. This will be the first time it's as a print that you don't have to worry about canvas and stretchers and things like that. The last picture uh, is from 2018. And this is just an example. And this is the first time I've ever shown it to anybody. Um, this is just an example of what you can do if all the stars line up and it's just good luck. This was at the opening of the Giacometti show at the Guggenheim uh, a year or so ago. And I was on one side and I just looked up and I saw this lady standing underneath the um, one of his iconic, one of Giacometti's iconic pictures or sculptures. And everything just lined up and I took the picture. And I, I, I think it, it really works the way the, the woman is and the way the sculpture is. So um, it's... In addition to taking lots of pictures, many um, wonderful photographers have given me photographs that they've taken. And my file drawers are full of pictures that come from, from other artists. and. As far as I'm concerned, pictures need to be on somebody's wall or to be shown. If they live in a file drawer, they're sort of dead. So I went through some of the file drawers and picked out um, three iconic pictures or uh, pictures that were of 
American icons and thought it would be interesting to see if anybody else thought these were as good as I did. The first one, I had a friend who I met in 1970, a noted photographer named Bert Stern. We got to be pals and um, did some projects together in the 1970s and then he went on and ultimately a few years ago Bert died. Bert is probably best known for his thousands of photographs that he took of Marilyn Monroe at the Beverly Hills Hotel um, at a bungalow at the Beverly Hills Hotel um, that's famously known as The Last Sitting. And these were done three or four or five weeks before she died. And much of Bert's reputation is based on that. He did a series of Later in the 1980s and 1990s, there were additions made of some of his, his prints and things like that. At, at one point, he had stored all of the black and white Marilyns at my house uh, for whatever reason. And then in the late 70s, early 80s, he was working on some other projects and he, um, other Marilyn projects, and he gave me this which is a Marilyn. I don't know which book that it was used in or, or whatever, but he has signed it down in the right-hand corner, Bert Stern, 6282, so I guess he gave it to me in 1982. And I've never seen it any other place. Um, so, but it is Bert and it's Marilyn Monroe, and um, there you are. Uh, another icon is Frank Sinatra. This is a photograph by a noted West Coast photographer named Phil Stern. I have it because quite by accident I found some negatives that had been, shall we say, uh, appropriated from Phil in the 1950s and had not been returned to him. I found them mixed in with some negatives of other people. They were photographs of two very famous jazz musicians, Dizzy Gillespie and Stan Getz. Uh, I printed up one of the pictures, made a Xerox of it, faxed it to Phil and said, look what I found. Would you like this? And <laughs> he sent me back a fax in about three seconds and said, my God, I've had, I haven't seen those since the 1950s. So I sent Phil off the negatives that I had found, and he um, sent me back a, a bunch of, of uh, pictures, one of which is this marvelous Frank Sinatra. Uh, I had never seen it. I think it's just stunningly wonderful. It's from the early 50s, maybe 53, 54, something like that. And it's been living in my uh, file cabinet for a long, long time, and it deserves to be on somebody's wall. Um, the other icon uh, is not a famous person. It is a woman who is known as the migrant mother. I mean, she actually made her way to a postage stamp. Why do I have this picture? In the 1970s, I did a book that was called A Vision Shared, that told the story of 11 of the most famous FSA photographers of the 1930s and early 40s, one of whom was Dorothea Lang, and her most famous photograph was The Migrant Mother. Um, at the same time, there were 10 other great photographers who were part of that, um, part of, of, of that program, one of whom was Arthur Rothstein. Uh, he was very much a part of my book and was a good friend. In mid-1970s, Arthur produced a portfolio of the, uh, I think, 10 or 11 most important photographs from the FSA program, one from each of the photographers, one by him. Uh, his most famous was called Dust Storm, Cimarron County, Oklahoma. It's on the wall right there, signed by Arthur. Um, 
and there was a picture from Jack Delano and a picture from Russell Lee and a picture from Ben Shaw. And this is the picture that he sh chose to represent Dorothea Lange. It certainly was her most famous from the period. And um, it too has been sitting in my file since the mid-70s. Um, and it deserves to pop out and, and be on someone's wall as well. It is not an old vintage print, old vintage prints. One just sold at Phillips for $85,000 or something like that. This is a print made in approximately 1975 from the negative by Arthur Rosting for this portfolio. So um, it's a, a, a way for you to have an iconic image that is not going to break the bank.